In the previous session, we discussed the concept of who am I? Meaning, we've discussed previously the fact that I am the occupant of this body. I'm housed within this body. <clears throat> I live in this body. But when this body dies and is buried, I will separate and I will live on for eternity. The question is, who am I and how do I understand myself? Now, as you go through life and as you begin to recognize what really makes you tick, you quickly come to the understanding that there's a lot more that's going on within me than is readily apparent. For instance, why is it that davening is so difficult? Why is it that one minute I'll be davening, I'll be right there speaking to Hashem, literally as I'm speaking to my friend, feel Hashem's presence, be fully cognizant, fully aware, and then two moments later I'm gone, I'm in space, I'm so far away that I can no longer even remember where I am. But the problem is, it's me. And I don't understand me. <clears throat> Why is it that I work that way? Why is it that one moment I'm so calm, I'm so easygoing, and then someone says the wrong line at the wrong time, and poof, like a rocket going off, I explode in anger, <clears throat> and I become a different person. I'm now berogous, I'm furious. I see red and I say things I would never say otherwise and I express myself in a manner that I typically never would and I become a different person. How do I understand myself when I become jealous? When I feel that tinge or that sense of unfairness? When you begin studying yourself carefully what you recognize is that the human is quite complex. The last session we discussed the why behind it and that is something that the Chovos of Halavavos explains to us and that is that Hashem created me out of two very distinct parts. There's a part of me that's a chelik elokimimal, that's the nefesh asichli, that's pure intellect, pure goodness. That part of me only wants to do what's good, what's right, what's proper. That part of me wants to serve Hashem. That part of me wants to help other people. That part of me deeply is concerned for others' goods. However, there's a whole other dimension to I. There's another part of me that couldn't care less about anyone or anything for that matter other than my own needs. There is a nefesh abahami, there is a part of my soul that is pure instincts, drives, and that has no interest in anyone else but myself. If you'd like to understand that part, the Chavaz has explained to us, all you have to do is go into the animal kingdom, study the various species, and you'll see the animal has a nefesh. That nefesh is alive, it's vibrant, and that part has a parallel in man. Whatever the species needs for its existence and the continuation of the species at whole is also put into man. Man has all of the instincts, all of the needs, all of the drives to continue his existence and to continue the species that is contained within the nefesh abahami. The I who am speaking, the I who thinks, <clears throat> the I who remember am comprised of both. For that reason, it is quite difficult for me to daven. There is a full half of me, a full half of my personality that screams out as loud as it can, Hashem does not exist. Hashem can't exist. Because the nefesh abahami, the physical part of my soul, cannot relate to anything that's not physical. Anything that exists in its world is something that it can sense with the five senses. If I can touch it, if I can smell it, if I could see it, if I could hear it, it exists, but if my five senses deny it, then it doesn't exist, because the behema, the nefesh abahami, the physical soul of man, the animal soul of man, only relates to the physical. Hence, anything that's not physical doesn't exist. Therefore, the behema side of me says, there is no Kaddish Baruch Hu, there is no God, there is no Creator. That half of me also denies the fact that I'll ever change, or certainly that I'll ever die. You see, the behema, the animal can only see that which is immediate and that which is clearly right in front of it. The fact that there'll be a future, the fact that there'll be a time called 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the fact that I'll leave this earth and have to answer for every moment of my life, the behemoth side, the animal soul cannot see nor can it relate to. If it's not immediate and revealed, the nefesh of Bahami, the animal soul doesn't see it. Hence, there's a full half of me that denies totally and completely that I'll ever answer in front of Hashem, that I'll ever stand there. There's a full half of me that screams out as loud as it can, the current situation will exist forever 
and will never change. And because that's fully half of my personality, the reality is that I'm in this constant state of flux, this constant state of change. The key point that the Chobos of Ovis explains to us is that both sides are in constant competition. Both sides are fighting for dominance, they're vying for primacy in terms of who controls I. Whichever one you exercise becomes stronger and becomes more dominant, much like a muscle that with use becomes stronger with disuse atrophies. If one engages in the Nefesh Bahami, it becomes stronger and more dominant. If one engages the Nefesh Sikhli, the intellectual part of the soul, then it becomes stronger and, in fact, becomes a more dominant force. But the two are in constant flux. One or the other is always gaining primacy. There is a full half of me, a full half of my personality that feels Hashem's presence with absolute clarity, that knows with vadoyas, with certainty, that Hashem is present. There's a full half of my personality that fully feels the holiness of a Shabbos, and there's a full half of my personality that only wants to do what's good, what's proper, what's right, and wants to help others. However, there is another half of me, and the I am in constant flux, the I am in constant change. And in order to understand yourself, you have to appreciate what the behemoth really is, and you have to get an eye glimpse in terms of how the Nefesh Bahami functions. The first concept to understand is that the Nefesh HaBahami, the physical soul of man, the animal soul, has no cognition. There's no intellect, there's no guiding force, there's no intelligence. And even when you see what looks like generosity in the Nefesh HaBahami, in the animal soul, it stems from a pre-programmed set of rules. For instance, the emperor penguin is a very prime example one of the wonders of Hashem's creation. The emperor penguin lives in the Arctic. The Arctic is a frigid, absolute barren wasteland. All you'll see for miles and miles and miles is ice and snow. When it's time for the penguin to mate, the mother penguin will give birth to the egg and then transfer that egg to the father. Now the difficulty is that if that egg touches the ice, it will crack and will cease to ever be born. Hence, it's a very delicate procedure. The male will stand with his feet together, and the female, after laying the egg, will nudge over to the male and gently transfer the egg from her onto the male's feet. When the egg is firmly placed on the feet, there's a flap in the, on the bottom of the male that will begin covering the egg. It will cover the egg, and the male will stand there. The female will then go to the fishing hole, which might be miles away. It will then fish and try to gain the fat needed so that when the egg hatches, the mother has the milk necessary to feed the baby. But here's the ironic part. The male will stand there day after day, week after week, for months on end, without moving, without feeding, to keep the egg warm. To keep that egg intact, the male must stand there immobile for literally months on end while effectively he's starving to death. To lose up to 25% of his body fat, pining away to a much smaller size, all that so that when the mother comes back months later, the egg will hatch and then the mother will be able to feed the baby. Now that looks like generosity, it looks like other centeredness, it looks like a wonderful thing. It is a wonder of Hashem's creation, it is brilliant, but it is pre programmed into the animal. The animal doesn't have a sense of generosity. It doesn't have a sense of looking out for the next generation. It's pre-programmed to do this, and it cannot move outside of the exact parameters of what it was programmed to do. For example, the mother baboon will care for its baby. It will be very caring, very, very delicate in the way it handles the baby. But ironically, long after the baby had died, the mother baboon will still take care of the child. You see, the mother baboon doesn't relate to the child in a sense of, let me take care of the child's delicate sense of self-esteem, let me allow the child to feel loved and welcome. The baboon has an instinct, has a desire to cuddle, to nourish, to care for the infant. 
but even when the infant has died, the mother baboon doesn't recognize that and continues to do the same activities because those are pre-programmed into the mother baboon. Those are merely instincts. Those are natural desires in the behemoth. And when you recognize the nature of the Nefesh Bahami, you recognize that the behemoth is dumb. The behemoth is so dumb because all it is is passions, instincts, desires, there's no cognition, there's no intelligence, there's no thought. And if you'd like to see an illustration of this, I find the following very, very telling. Japanese scientists did a study. There was a certain group of monkeys who were on a, a colony of monkeys who were on an island, and these scientists wanted to study the cognitive abilities, the intelligence of this colony of monkeys. These particular monkeys loved sweet potatoes. <clears throat> what the scientists did was they would take the sweet potatoes each morning and cover them with sand. Then, then they would leave these sweet potatoes on the beach and wait for the monkeys to come take them. The monkeys would see <clears throat> the sweet potatoes, the monkey would take a bite of the sweet potato, and then <clears throat> after taking one bite, the sand would get into the throat, <clears throat> the monkey would sort of <clears throat> gag, spit it out, and that would be the end of the sweet potato. Day after day, the monkeys would pick up the sand-covered sweet potato, take a bite, realize it's uncomfortable, and would stop eating it. Until one morning, a 18-month-old baby monkey picked up the sweet potato off the beach and for some unknown reason began playing with it in the water. Unbeknownst to it, it washed the sand off of the sweet potato, and when it ate that sweet potato, it didn't get the sand in the throat, <clears throat> hence it was able to eat the whole sweet potato, and it learned that if you wash off the sweet potato, the sand leaves it and you can eat it. The mother of that baby learned the same behavior and she too copied that behavior. This study began in 1952 and after a while the entire colony learned that behavior. Would you like to know how long it took the colony of monkeys to learn that behavior? It took four years. Four years it took the colony of monkeys to recognize the fact that if you wash the sweet potato off, the sand leaves it and you could eat the sweet potato without it scratching your throat. Four years. Even after it was discovered by the baby, it took years for that to spread to the rest of the colony because the monkey may look intelligent, may feign intellect, but it lacks cognitive abilities. They're all of the instincts, all of the drives, all of the inclination for the survival of the monkey is there, but the anochi, the eye, the intellect is lacking, hence the cognitive ability to say, if this, then that, if I do this, this will occur, it doesn't exist, and therefore the behemoth is quite dumb. And that is very essential in understanding I. You see, I have a full half of me that is nefesh abahami. And if you'd like to see a classic example of that, just watch the next time you lose your temper. Imagine the following scene. Your boss says something to you and you see red, furious. <clears throat> Chutzpah, how could he say that to me? And you get in your car and you drive home and the whole way home that tape is playing in your brain over and over and you're getting more agitated and more agitated. <clears throat> By the time you get into your house, you run up to your door, <clears throat> run up to your bedroom, you slam the door and you smash your fist right through the bedroom door. Now, here's the question. What did you gain by smashing your bedroom door? <laughs> the answer is not a lot. If you were to smash your boss, maybe we'd debate whether that's intelligent or not. But what you did was dumb. You gained nothing. Your boss doesn't even know about it. It certainly didn't hurt him. So what did you accomplish with that act of smashing your fist through your bedroom door? The answer is nothing. The answer is it was dumb. So if so, why did you do it? Why would you, an intelligent, thinking, rational person, do something that's clearly not intelligent, something that's dumb? But you see, that question is utterly irrelevant. Because kas, anger, is neither smart nor dumb. <coughs> kas is a midah. It is a pre-programmed part of the nefesh bahami. It is an instinct, it is a drive. When you say X, Y, and Z, and I'm in the wrong mood, I explode, I see red, and I'm furious. But that's not intelligent nor lacking in intelligence. It is a drive, it is an instinct, it is a meter in the person. We might ask a different question, and that is because I have a nefesh of Bahami and a nefesh of Sikhli, because I have two dimensions to me, why didn't I learn the strategies and techniques to control the behemoth? 
Why didn't I learn how to harness that power, control it and use it for my benefit and not allow it to harm me? There, intelligence can function. I, the master of the ship, can determine which media to use at which time. I can control them. I can allow some to expand, some to contract. I can control the balance. That's where intelligence falls in. That's where intelligence comes to play. But in terms of the outgrowth, once that media has come to the fore, once I become angry, once I become furious, there is no holding it back. And there is no question of intelligence or non-intelligence because the media has exploded. That character trait is there. The drives and in instincts are functioning. That is the human. When you begin to study the human, you quickly recognize that the I am comprised of very different components. Within me, there are many different midos. There is a mida called jealousy. I don't understand it, but I never needed that car. I never even thought about the car until you got it. When he drives up with that Jaguar, ooh, I see green. I got to have it. I didn't need it until he had it. I didn't even know that there was such a thing as a custom-made suit. I was certainly unaware of it being better quality until my next-door neighbor shows up in shul with it, and then all of a sudden, I have to have it. And what I quickly realize is that there are many components to the eye. I have desires, drives, inclinations that are put into the fabric of my being. To ignore them is foolish. The wise man comes to recognize what motivates me, what drives me, what makes me tick, and then studies the Torah system to allow me to harness them. I, the master of the ship, am supposed to be the animal trainer. The Chesh Ben Nefesh, one of the great Muslims for him, begins his introduction by explaining that there's a thing called an elephant trainer. An elephant may weigh 14,000 pounds, and a man who weighs 150 pounds can control that elephant. Because that trainer has trained that elephant, that elephant now obeys the commands of the trainer, and despite the fact that the elephant can crush the man with but a simple nudge of its trunk, the elephant obeys the exact commands and will of its trainer. The Chesh Ben Nefesh explains that that is us. We have various Midos character traits. We have a Nefesh Abhami that is purely, purely dumb. The only way to think about the Nefesh Abhami is to think of it as hungers, appetites, and you'll excuse me saying in this way, just a hungry. The Behemoth has no intellect. It has no vision. It has no understanding. It's pure drives. It sees what it wants. It wants what it sees, and it needs to have it. It doesn't care nor is aware of results. It can't see Hashem can't see the future, cannot in any sense be concerned for anyone else. When you understand that, and you understand the different parts of you, you begin to function, and you begin to work on a very different level. The key point being that each part is in constant flux, constant battle for control of I. And here's a very eye-opening concept that the Chovah Zavavah shares with us. He says, whatever we do during our day, Whatever we're engaged in, whatever we're involved in, feeds the Nefesh Bahami. Most of our waking moments are spent on our existence, our survival, on inyoni, the alma things of this world, whether it be earning a living, whether it be eating, whether it be taking care of our daily needs. The bottom line is that our Nefesh Bahami is functioning all day, every day, 24-7. Hence, the Nefesh Bahami is constantly being strengthened, and it constantly becomes more dominant, and constantly gains primacy over Nefesh Sikhli. For that reason, the Torah gave us very specific mitzvahs, very specific commandments, how to win the battle, how to conquer the Nefesh Bahami. All of the mitzvahs of the Torah strengthen the Seichel. They don't allow the Behemoth to win out. The foods that we eat, as I mentioned last time, <coughs> that are the foods that are forbidden are foods that typically strengthen the Nefesh Bahami in an inordinate <coughs> manner, hence the Torah forbids them. Certain activities <coughs> give the Nefesh Bahami an added strength, the Torah forbids them. And the Torah commands us in everything that strengthens the Nefesh Sikhli. And I'll give you one prime example. When you look at another human being and you say to yourself as follows, I'm deeply concerned for that person's benefit. <clears throat> I'm concerned for that person's welfare. I care about that person and I want to help them. The Nefesh Bahami within you screams out, what are you saying? When I want to help that person financially <clears throat> or physically, when I want to reach out to aid that person, 
the behemoth within me screams out, says, what are you doing? What do you care about them? Take care of you. You need, you have to have, what are you worrying about? Others take care of you. And that act of chesed, that act of stucca, is menaged, battles against the nefesh of Bahami. Because the animal soul within me only knows about my needs, is only concerned for my needs, and cannot relate to anyone else's needs. When I'm other-centered, when I focus on someone else's needs, and I reach out to help that person, what I'm doing is I'm vanquishing, I'm winning the battle against the nefesh of Bahami, because I'm acting with the nefesh of Sikhli coming to the fore, and all of the mitzvahs of the Torah, specifically and primarily chesed, specifically and primarily learning Torah, strengthen the nefesh of Sikhli, and don't allow the nefesh of Bahami to win out and become stronger. The reality is that there's an awful lot of complexity within the human. All of the various midos, from taiva for food, to anger, to jealousy, to a simple mida called laziness. Laziness, this heaviness, this absolute inability to move, this ugh. When you're in a very powerfully lazy mood, nothing moves you. You know, sir, the, the building is burning. Uh, you know, you, you're going to die. Uh, I'll get up soon. I'm just lazy. There's a heaviness. And the Silas Sharm calls it Afrius Homrius Gas. The physicality is thick. There's a heaviness. There's a heaviness to physicality that doesn't allow you to move. The opposite of that is Zrezus. Zrezus is alacrity, moving quickly, going. That stems from Nefesh Asichli. The more a person acts in a lazy manner, the stronger that Mida becomes, the more the Nefesh Bahami controls the person. The more a person <coughs> acts with alacrity, with Zrezus, the stronger that becomes. But the point being, throughout our life, throughout everything we do, we're in constant battle, we're in constant change. <coughs> One or the other is always winning out. And if you would like to understand yourself, you have to come to understand a full half of your personality. You have to go out into the animal kingdom and you have to study the animal species. You have to see what makes them tick. You have to see what drives them, what motivates them, and you have to understand that that's fully a part of you. There is a part of you with all of the hungers, the appetites, and instincts that you find in the animal kingdom. Not only can't you deny that, you're not supposed to eliminate that. The Torah wants us to harness that. That is that powerful elephant that horse that, if I control, will bring me to great heights. If I allow it to control me, then I become a behemoth. Many people that you see are more behemoth than they are Adam. If a person allows their nefesh or bahami, their animal soul, to come to the fore, their instincts, <coughs> their drives, their passions become more powerful and more powerful until they lose the ability to control them. They become addicted. I spoke to a drug counselor once who told me an interesting thing. He said that when he's working with heroin, at, <coughs> excuse me, heroin addicts, he doesn't allow them to go into New York City. And I asked him, <coughs> what's wrong with New York City? He explained, what do you mean, how can I let them go into New York City? And <coughs> they'll start using again. Why? Because there's a trigger. There's a terrible trigger. You see, drug addicts, when they see that which reminds them of the drug, that will trigger them to begin using the drug again. So I innocently asked him, what is the trigger? He said, the Empire State Building. At which point I asked, what is a trigger about the Empire State Building? He said, to a drug addict, it looks like a hypodermic needle. You see, the tall antenna resembles a needle. And he's explained that many of his previous addicts who were reformed ended up becoming, using again because of that trigger. You have to be a heroin addict to see the Empire State Building as a trigger, but that's someone who's addicted to a particular drug. So too, much like any addiction, a person can become addicted to his midos. What that means is they become stronger and stronger. The drives, the desires become more powerful until a person loses his control, loses his ability to stop them. They become so predominant, they become so powerful that the person no longer is able to stop them. That is a behemoth. That is a behemoth who walks like an odom, walks like a man, but is actually really just a two-legged behemoth. However, man also has the ability to be the opposite. If a person follows the Torah system, if a person learns to harness the behemoth, he becomes more in control. The Nevesha Bahami becomes <coughs> excuse me, weaker and weaker. The Nevesha Sikhli becomes stronger and stronger. He becomes a Malach. He becomes literally an angel walking on this planet. He looks like a man, but he's a Malach. 
that ultimately is the purpose of life and whatever state you're in at the last moment of your existence is a state that you'll be for eternity because that's the purpose of this life to use our time <clears throat> to use the kochas we're given to reach the great heights which Hashem gave us the ability to reach.